My name is Matthew Gudorf. Uh, I've been working on spatiotemporal chaos, uh, specifically with the Kuramoto-Shivashinsky equation, on a new formulation, uh, which I call a spatiotemporal formulation. And even though everyone works in space and time, um, this is specifically dedicated to an, it's a new approach that uh, we think hasn't been seen before. So just to give a brief introduction into what chaos and turbulence is, I think most people are probably familiar with turbulence uh, in the you know, setting of air travel. But more generally speaking, tur turbulence and chaos uh, is a phenomenon that is exhibited in many different systems, uh, ranging from you know magneto-hydrodynamics to fluid flows to um, uh, the Kermano-Shivashinsky equation, as I've, I have here, um, nonlinear drifts of lasers, and like a, a crazy number of phenomena. But it's yet uh, unexplained, even though it's still uh, a classical uh, physics problem. It's one of the you know biggest outstanding classical physics problems um, uh, yet to be explained. And it's actually a millennium problem. So uh, the prototypical system for turbulence is the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a uh, formulation of fluid flow of a velocity field u, vector velocity field u, in terms of uh, pressure and possibly some external forcing. Uh, it's mainly a, you know, it captures um, conservation of mass and, and momentum uh, in the fluid flow. And this is the incompressible version, I believe. So, um, this is what we eventually want to get to, but I'm only working at the Kermodoshivashinsky equation. Um, so, you know, we don't know, I don't know if these ideas generalize. Uh, I hope they do because they scale. Um, but uh, eventually, this is what we're targeting. Um, and just to give you an idea of why the new formulation is required is because there have been lots of new experiments uh, in recent times uh, that have been getting progressively better as technology has been um, upgraded, you know, with new imagery techniques like PIV and things like this. Um, but the computational studies uh, have been have a hard time uh, being extended to larger spatial domains. So a lot of the results computationally have existed, or sorry, uh, have uh, manifested on small domains called minimal cells uh, in which people describe uh, time invariant solutions as exact coherent structures. So finding equilibria, uh, periodic orbits, um, and, and you know other uh, time invariant sets. Um, now this is done due to advances in computational science. So you know time has progressed. And so we hope to you know continue this progress towards larger and larger spatiotemporal dom domains so that we can apply uh, new ideas and, and perform computations on physically relevant scales on the same order of the you know larger and larger experiments. Um, these ideas, the computational ideas, follow a dynamical systems formulation, which uh, even though it's not proven to exist for the Navier-Stokes equation, we typically think of infinitely dimensional PDEs of strongly contracting flows as traversal of an inertial manifold. Uh, so it's some sub-manifold uh, where dissipation causes or forces solutions to live. Um, and we can you know, view dynamics given by this cartoon that I drew uh, as being a time parametrized uh, uh, trajectory, the black curvy line with dots at each end. Uh, now note, this is a cartoon. And so there's intersections and, and other things that wouldn't actually be present dynamical systems. But uh, it's a cartoon, like I said. Uh, and I'm trying to show that by virtue of uh, the dynamics here, uh, you know, the fictitious dynamics, that the path follows and comes close to different time invariant sets. So the dots with the red and green axes are, you know, uh, representing equilibria, and the blue curves uh, are representing periodic orbit. So the general idea is that uh, you traverse the state space, so you, you traverse this manifold by entering on stable manifolds and leaving on unstable manifolds of these different time invariant sets. Um, and while this is you know, a very interesting and deep uh, region of study, uh, we don't think that it's the way forward because you're beholden to exponentially unstable uh, dynamics. So you have uh, positive Lyapunov exponents, and you, know, you can only predict within finite windows of time. 
So the way that we or the, the ideas that we propose moving forward are to instead of using dynamics is simply to use spatiotemporal patterns. So you can think of these as movies, um, but I think in the kermona shubashinsky equation, you'll see that you can visually represent them uh, and, and that might be easier to, to understand. Um, now the claim is that these spatiotemporal patterns due to commuting translational invariances actually shadow d plus one dimensional tori if you're in a d, d dimensions of space and one dimensional time. Uh, and the idea is that they recur throughout space time. So if you capture the most important patterns, uh, that meaning the patterns that occur with the highest frequency, um, then you can describe uh, space-time as shadowing of these patterns. And believe it or not, everyone here has already done this. Uh, you already use spatiotemporal patterns uh, uh, to make predictions in space and time. Uh, namely, uh, you look at clouds and you see, OK, there's a giant thunder cell approaching. Uh, well, that's a spatial pattern. And then you see it's approaching you, and that's a spatiotemporal pattern because it's evolving in time towards you. Uh, and so we already know that space-time patterns exist. Uh, they exist in coherent shapes like tornadoes and hurricanes. Uh, and <clears throat> excuse me. And they can be used to uh, to make predictions. Now the problem is that in order to classify all these predictions in these larger and larger systems, we need some manageable small pieces, which we haven't figured out yet what those what those should be. But the goal here is to find the most frequently appearing pieces and then try to use them as the building blocks of turbulence. Now, some, like I said earlier, with the, the frequency being the determining factor as to how important they are, uh, in the bottom left here, there's, or bottom right, sorry, there's these clouds, uh, lenticulars, uh, clouds that form in disks. Obviously, if you only have these disks, I know they exist outside of just mountain ranges, but if you had a cloud formation that only exists spatially localized on these mountain formations, then even though it's a co coherent shape, it wouldn't have that much importance because, uh, you know, it doesn't happen uh, everywhere else. So um, we know that spatiotemporal patterns matter. We know that recurrences in space time matter because uh, the, the corny one-liner that I had in my head all week was thunderstorms don't only appear in Kansas on Tuesdays, right? They recur throughout time. They occur all the time, uh, and they recur throughout space as well. So to investigate the, I, these ideas, we proposed the usage of the kermode shivashinsky equation, which has been used to study many, many different phenomena. Uh, it has one spatial dimension denoted by x and one temporal dimension denoted by t. Uh, and in this case, we're going to be looking at it on compact domains uh, determined by the dimensions capital T and capital L. Now, because the, we're going to be using doubly periodic boundary conditions, these, even though we're, you know, the domain is compact up to translations, it actually provides infinite uh, spatiotemporal solutions. And hence, that's where the name spatiotemporal tiling comes in. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to show these ideas visually, but just to give you a rundown on what the kerman Shinsky equation is, uh, first we make a transformation to make it non-dimensional because that's, uh, you know, just convenient. Uh, and we see that there's a first order time derivative, second order spatial derivative, fourth order spatial derivative, and a non-linear term. Uh, so generally speaking, if you look at the linearized spectrum about the, the solution u equals zero, you get a, a it's a, a quartic polynomial uh, where there's a finite number of, or a finite range of uh, unstable modes and uh, 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 infinitely many contracting modes. Uh, so generally speaking, what, what the terms do is the second derivative pumps in energy into the system. So it's like the normal dissipative term in the Navier-Stokes equations, except it has the wrong sign. Uh, but luckily, we have the fourth order term, which essentially damps all higher order uh, or high frequency uh, uh, oscillations, and then you have the nonlinear term, which mediates between the energy production on the large scales and the energy dissipation on the small scales. Um, so I'm going to denote this as f, and then I'm going to say that, OK, solutions, the velocity fields u, t of x, uh, u is a function of t and x that satisfy doubly periodic boundary conditions and satisfy the equation f equals 0 will be uh, be the doubly periodic solutions we're looking for. Now, one of the mo before we get into the full spatiotemporal formulation, one of the motivations of this was uh, the very first thing given, to, the very first problem given to me by Barack Budenor and, and Predrag, uh, which was, if space truly equals time, if we're saying that these invariant tori exist, well, by virtue of them being tori, uh, it, it, as, 
in the same way that we can integrate in time and, and wrap ourselves because of this periodic boundary condition in time, it's to use uh, Fourier modes, temporal Fourier modes. Uh, and so by creating, you know, a, a, a using a Fourier transform and then rewriting the equations, we get an expression for the evolution of these Fourier mode components with respect to space. Now, it turns out that uh, attractors in the temporal system generally, quote unquote, generally correspond to repellers in the spatial system. This was you know, something we realized after the fact that I had trouble, and then we found this literature uh, on chronotopic uh, uh, covariant Lyapunov vectors and, and really long, confusing titles. But uh, basically, they make the claim that uh, generally, if you do this type of, uh, you know, switching, making space-time, you, you have a repeller. And so that's basically what I found is if you try and integrate in space, then you get exponentially diverging uh, dynamics where you no longer are you know, on this attracting inertial manifold, you just go off into infinity. Uh, but luckily you can reproduce the torus by integrating it in space, uh, although the accuracy of doing so uh, quickly degrades. On the left, I've shown the accuracy difference between the time and the space integration. Now, uh, the because the system is reversible due to symmetry, uh, I actually integrated from uh, half of the space, half of the spatial domain forward in space and half backwards in space. So that's why it kind of looks like uh, you get this seam down the middle uh, because I translated everything to be in the middle so it'd be easier to see. Or, or moving on. So we can do the spatial, we can treat space as time. So the continuous dimensions are on the same footing sort of, except they, you know, they have different properties. So this just reinforced the fact that we need something that's not beholden to, you know, exponentially divergent or exponentially unstable uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, and to do so, we propose a spatiotemporal formulation which uh, uh, poses the problem as a boundary value problem. Now, in the spatiotemporal formulation, we consider space and time to both be infinite as opposed to just fixing space uh, as some fixed spatial domain and keeping time infinite. Uh, uh, we, now, both are infinite. Um, and by doing so, we're saying that uh, locally you're going to be shadowing small d plus one dimensional invariant tori. So the little uh, uh, matrices I've given here represent what you would see or what you would envision the symbolic dynamics as being. So when you're on a fixed spatial domain and you're proceeding uh, uh, through your inertial manifold in time, you know, if you just make the simple assumption of binary dynamics, which is, of course, is too simplified, you would, you know, alternate and visit different regions of state space, which you could label with some symbols. Now, uh, as space and time are infinite, now you have to specify a two-dimensional um, uh, uh, symbolic sequence in order to specify the pattern that you're shadowing within space and time. Uh, now, I think this is best explained visually, uh, and so that's what I'm going to do before we get into the formal presentation of the actual equations. Uh, so. On the left is a trajectory generated by time integration, which is not something I use often, but it is useful for comparison purposes. And on the right is an invariant torus, uh, which is actually relative periodic. So uh, I'll get into that in a second, but this is just treat it as an example pattern. So you can think of the left-hand side as being the weather and the right-hand side as being a cloud. Okay, so the idea is we wanna figure out how often, uh, quali uh, this is a qualitative argument, how often this cloud is exhibited in space-time. Okay, because if, if every region in space-time is locally shadowing invariant tori, well then, if we give an invariant torus then, and we move it and translate it around space-time, then we should see it appearing. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. Now, our claim is that everywhere is shadowed by invariant tori, right? Uh, so the fact that we don't see a very high frequency, though there's large gaps in this, in this plot, right? There's not, it doesn't cover nearly as much space-time as we would want, but uh, that's actually to be expected because if we're only using a single invariant torus, then the left-hand side is being approximated as the right-hand side here. So this is what we refer to as a tiling of space-time, where we have some doubly periodic domain. In this case, it's relative periodic, so that's why you see the, the, a slight slant to all of the, uh, uh, the patterns here. But we take this torus, and then we tile the infinite uh, space-time with it, and then we see where this locally shadows uh, or is locally shadowed in space-time. Um, so we can treat the cutouts as being local shadowings of this tiling. Uh, now, of course, 
there's a lot of different uh, factors at play, like translations, uh, and and uh, so as you see, like the the cutouts on the left don't necessarily agree exactly with the right because of symmetries and translational invariances and things like this. So it's it's a lot more complicated than just uh, making one tiling and then saying it's locally shadowed. We would not expect uh, good results from a single orbit tiling because obviously uh, these two, you know, the the time simulation and the single orbit tiling do not look anything alike. So in fact, I would not expect a large region of space time to be covered. Now, if we increase the number of patterns slightly, so in this case, uh, I'm using continuous family members, which I'll discuss after I you know, formulate everything, we can cover a larger amount of space time. So in other words, the shadowing events don't occur uh, exactly. They occur, you need to use a fuzzy window in order to find these different patterns in space time. The shadowing is locally, you know, on the interior of our windows, it's, it's close to the tori, but then near the boundaries, it's being affected by its local neighborhood. So uh, on the left is the uh, the different regions that say qualitatively shadow that one pattern, and on the right is uh, qualitatively shadowing that collection of seven or so uh, variants of that same pattern. And as you can see, that you know, in this qualitative example, at least, you are covering a, a larger amount of space time. Um, so this is how the spatiotemporal, you know, this this is the motivation was this this picture. Okay, uh, there's some pattern you you translate it around space time and you can find it embedded in larger uh, regions of space time. The method proceeds as follows: in order to you know classify and enumerate these patterns, we need some method of finding these doubly periodic orbits. Um, and so we are going to pose this as a boundary value problem. Uh, but first, we need to to find some key terms like uh, tiling, tiles, orbits, like what I mean by those those terminologies, because I'm I'm basically using sh a lot of shorthand here because there's a lot of different things that have similar names. Once I define these doubly periodic orbits, uh, or what I mean by that, uh, then we can derive the equations, the symmetries, the optimization problems, and then finally we get to the interesting things, which are the new spatiotemporal techniques that I've developed. A tile is going to be a discret, discretized uh, uh, region of space time, and an orbit is going to be a, a solution, which is a doubly periodic solution velocity field on top of that tile. So in the pictures that I've given here, uh, this is just like the numerical representation where you have some space time mesh of 16 points by 16 points, and then at each of those points, uh, you consider there to be a field value. Um, so you have your discretized field on top of your discretized region of space time. Now, of course, these dimensions, you know, they, they exist as dimensions that satisfy uh, the equations, not necessarily, you know, they're not just discrete quantities that, uh, numerical quantities. The key idea here is that we're going to allow the, the different dimensions, the, the spatial and temporal periods to be functions of the optimization process, aka uh, they're independent variables. So your spatial domain and, sp and temporal domain are going to be allowed to vary uh, as a function of your optimization process. Uh, now this is very, un you know, unconventional uh, due to, you know, if you tried to change uh, the spatial domain in, in a Planck-Coet simulation slightly, you would get a completely different uh, simulation uh, right away. But by adopting a variational formulation, uh, we can essentially do this without uh, having, you know, these exponential divergences. Um, so because of translational variances and these doubly periodic boundary conditions, we define some uh, spatial temporal Fourier transforms, which are just a bunch of trigonometric, uh, trigonometric polynomials expansions. And I use a real valued or uh, uh, cosines and sines as opposed to complex exponentials uh, because of of some symmetries and, and different arguments in the future uh, and computational region reasons such as, uh, you know, very specific computational reasons, uh, actually, so I won't get into it. Um, the way that I'm going to represent these modes uh, is in a tensor form where uh, if you see here, there's four different sets of modes uh, dependent on the parity of the different uh, polynomial, the basis functions, so cosines and sines, so A corresponds to cosine and cosine, etc. So we represent these modes as a tensor uh, and and generally, even though, uh, so I, I consider everything to be post-discretization. So, um, you know, 
even though these solutions are inf inherently infinitely dimensional, I'm always going to be treating them as some discrete quantity. Um, because of that, I define what I call as a state vector, which is going to be a collection of the modes uh, and the other degrees of freedom, such as the temporal and spatial dimensions, and then possibly some extra parameters, uh, which we'll see in the future will be uh, related to continuous symmetries. Because we've extended our uh, definitions to space and time, we can now define uh, the symmetries of the equations as being uh, subgroups and, and uh, of a continu uh, sorry of a spatiotemporal uh, symmetry group. So, for example, uh, anti-symmetric the the symmetries we're considering here are these are the orbits that have uh, arisen in the past. The sorry, the types of symmetries that have arisen in the past for periodic orbits. Uh, for for instance, uh, anti-symmetric orbits, which are invariant under spatial reflection, equilibria, relative periodic orbits. One of the new ideas here is that uh, pre-periodic orbits, which are uh, periodic orbits that have a fundamental domain, which you can uh, use discrete symmetry operations to produce uh, the remainder of the orbit. So for instance, uh, you have half of the orbit. Its reflection is what finishes the orbit. Uh, those now exist in a spatiotemporal uh, symmetry invariant subspace. So no longer do you have to think about things as uh, fundamental domains. They now exist in a subspace all on, all on their own. Um, before I get into the different subgroups and derivations regarding symmetry, uh, I want to make the distinction between equivariance and invariance. So equivariance is going to be um, symmetry. A, a solution is going to be equivariant under a symmetry if uh, the symmetry transformation applied to that solution is also a solution. But invariance is going to be saying um, the solution is exactly the same. So the discretized field is exactly the same, which is going to be important um, because if we pose the discrete symmetries as existing in, as subgroups of, um, so they're, they're going to exist as subgroups of this, uh, this in and of itself, a subgroup of the overarching symmetry group SO2 by uh, O2. Um, the, the invariance is going to manifest as selection rules, or which will be constraints on the mode. So taking this subgroup, uh, we, we can construct, uh, using the, the character table, uh, we can construct some linear projection operators, decompose this into uh, uh, irreducible subspaces, uh, defined by those projection operators, which in turn correspond to a subspace of the different modes uh, written here as in terms of the different indices on the different uh, components of the tensor. Um, now, it turns out that the symmetries, the aforementioned symmetries, such as uh, spatial reflection invariance and shift reflection invariance, uh, actually manifest as symmetry invariant subspaces, as I said before. And that can be seen by, uh, if you take the combination of projection operators and apply them to the kermode shivashinsky equation, then you will arrive at different manifestations which only have a subset of the total amount of components. By showing this, uh, you show that the different symmetry subspaces actually correspond to different uh, constraints on the spatiotemporal mode. So in one way, in one interpretation, one perspective, this is the manifestation of the fundamental, the idea of fundamental domain in terms of the modes. So just like when you're pre-periodic, you only need half of the total periodic orbit to represent um, that's the amount of non-redundant information. The same thing occurs in space-time, where you have a sub subset of half of modes that are non-vanishing, so they're not constrained to be zero. Likewise, for the anti-symmetric orbits, uh, you have half the modes that are constrained to be zero. Uh, and for equilibria, you have only the non-zero, or sorry, the only non-zero mo non modes are the zeroth modes uh, with respect to time. Okay, for continuous symmetry, so relative periodic solutions, I use a uh, co-moving frame on Zutz, which is a time-dependent uh, uh, parametrization, uh, which makes um, the space-time field uh, closed uh, only after this translation. So uh, in normal uh, dynamical systems, what you have is uh, you, you integrate through a period in time, and then in order to be periodic, you have to apply some spatial shift. So this is uh, one parametrization of doing that. Um, another alternative would be to slice the SO2 symmetry and just remove it from the discussion completely, but there's a number of numerical reasons uh, why I don't do that. Um, so this transformation, uh, what it does is 
generates an extra term uh, when you take a time derivative. Essentially, that's that's basically it, um, because you know you have this extra factor of s times t, where s is the spatial shift and t is the temporal period. You have this translation inside of your uh, expansion now, and so when you take a temporal der derivative, you'll have um, that pop out. Uh, okay. So speaking of derivatives, uh, we need to in order to define the kromano shivashinsky equation in terms of these modes, we need to define derivatives and in, in this uh, spectral space that's going to be represented by multiplication by different uh, spatiotemporal frequencies. Uh, so the spatial frequencies are, are I, I gave them previously, but I probably glossed through them too quick. Uh, QK is going to be 2 pi K over L, so it's going to be the spatial wave numbers or spatial frequencies, and omega J are going to be the temporal frequencies, so that's 2 pi, uh, 2 pi J over T. Um, the non, so the linear terms are evaluated simply by multiplying the uh, corresponding modes by the correct frequencies. So this is denoted as element-wise multiplication. Uh, and the nonlinear term is going to be computed in a pseudo-spectral manner, which is uh, instead of computing the nonlinear term as a convolution in spectral space, it'll be computed as a element-wise product in physical space and brought back to the Fourier mode space. You can break this into uh, uh, components of the, based on the modes. Um, as follows, uh, where you know all the relative A, C, B, D are the field representations of the different modes, so the inverse Fourier transform of the of the modes uh, labeled by indices J, K, um, and so this yields the kromano shivashinsky equation in uh, the space time in terms of these spatial temporal modes, um, where you have the linear term being the first term here added to the nonlinear term. The next piece of the puzzle is once you have the equations in terms of the modes, you're going to need, uh, for the Newton type methods, you're going to need the Jacobian matrix, uh, which is a, basically a gradient with respect to the state vector, which is contains the modes, the temporal period, and the spatial period, which is a underdetermined set of equations. So you have to, I, I'm, we're going to be solving something a least square, linear least square system as opposed to a square linear system. And to describe these different gradients, uh, I use the, uh, matrix representation of the operators which exist after you differentiate with respect to the modes. Uh, and then likewise for the uh, temporal partial derivative and spatial partial derivative, uh, those, those occur um, because of the implicit dependence of the spatial and temporal frequencies on T and L. These are the partial derivatives. <coughs> And so now we have all the tools that we need in order to define the optimization problem properly. So I use what a, this is formalism applied to this. Um, so I keep it general at first because uh, it can be useful for uh, derivations regarding continuous symmetries, um, or at least it, it possibly could. I, I failed at doing so. But the explicit representation we're going to use is actually just a least squares representation. But I'll keep them general for now so that we uh, everyone can see where this variational formulation or reference to a variational formulation is coming from. So we define what uh, uh, Abramov calls, calls a formal Lagrangian, which is essentially just a Lagrange multiplier times the kromano shivashinsky equation. Uh, and then we say uh, that that defines uh, the action, which is a function of this formal Lagrangian uh, integral. Sorry, it's a functional of this uh, formal Lagrangian. Uh, and the variables are treated to be u, its partial derivatives, the independent parameters pi, which uh, uh, contain the temporal and spatial period at least, uh, and then this adjoint variable lambda. So lambda is a when I say an adjoint variable, it lives in some uh, appropriate space of functions that that uh, uh, satisfies the corresponding doubly periodic boundary f conditions. Um, and this can be used to derive a weak formulation of the equations uh, via integration by parts. But uh, like I said, that's, uh, that's left for other calculations. And I, in fact, do not use that at this time. The usage of this formal Lagrangian, so, uh, and, and the action is that uh, its station points, so the stationary points of this action, are going to represent the W periodic solutions that I claim exist. Um, and so those stationary points uh, correspond to solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations, which in turn can be derived by this total derivative operation, uh, which is the QIs are going to be the uh, space-time uh, variables uh, T and X. And then the WIs are going to be the field 
equals u and lambda. Um, so if we take these total derivatives, we recover the Kermit-Oshibashinsky equation, its adjoint equation, and uh, uh, some equations with the partial derivatives of the uh, parameters within them. Um, and so a doubly periodic solution is going to be, uh, after after I make the choice lambda equals f, uh, which is the Kermit-Oshibashinsky equation, uh, it becomes solutions to the, the least squares optimization problem, where I define a cost function, which is the uh, inner product of uh, f transpose and f. Uh, and then I say that the double periodic solutions, which satisfy f equals 0, uh, also satisfy phi equals 0, uh, because phi f equals 0 implies phi equals 0. Um, to solve this problem, so that is finding the zeros of this function, uh, the codes I've developed, which I have yet to mention, uh, are going to be released as a uh, Python package. It's on GitHub right now, which I'll advertise later. Uh, but it has the following numerical methods available to it. Um, most of these methods are just functions wrapped from uh, the scientific computing distribution SciPy. Um, the ones that I considered to be customly written or at least modified are the adjoint descent algorithm by uh, Mohamed Farazman and uh, the least squares algorithm, which is it, all it does is it produces the uh, pseudo inverse to the matrix, but now I'll get into that. So all of these are available, and actually more are coming that are available, but not all of these apply to the problem. Um, so for instance, some of these require the system to be symmetric and uh, uh, and to have bounded eigenvalues of the linear system, and uh, these properties aren't satisfied, but they're included because the computing package is targeted towards a general broader uh, audience of anyone who wants to solve spatial temporal PDEs. Mm -hmm. um, so the adjoint descent method uh, is derived by taking a fictitious uh, time derivative of the cost function, because the idea is uh, in order to solve the numerical optimization problem, we want to decrease the value of phi uh, until it is 0. So we have some initial condition, which I'm saying is v, uh, and that starts at some non-zero value of phi. And then we take a fictitious time derivative, and using some numerical stepping, we move phi towards zero. And once it reaches a certain tolerance of zero, then we'll say that that is a sufficient uh, 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 condition for saying that our state now approximates a uh, doubly periodic orbit. Um, so we take a fictitious time derivative, and then we see that if we make the substitution, so if we make the choice that the partial time der or fictitious time derivative of our state is equal to the adjoint of the Jacobian times f, then we see that the partial time partial fictitious time derivative, sorry, that's a mouthful, of phi is is not increasing. So it's it's less than or equal to zero. Uh, likewise, if we take the same expression for the partial fictitious time derivative, but now we require uh, the corrections to satisfy the Newton equation. So this would be derived by linearization of uh, linearization of f around a uh, uh, root, so or of a doubly periodic orbit, you would get this system of equations. Uh, and making this choice, so it's requiring your your steps to satisfy this, also implies that uh, your corrections uh, decrease the value of the residual. So these are applied, like I'm saying. Uh, you choose a direction to step in that decreases the residual, and then you numerically step in them by either solving the Newton system or computing this adjoint descent direction. Practical terms, solving the linear system is not always available because of the computational memory requirements. So because we need to keep the spatiotemporal discretization in memory, the Jacobian very quickly becomes a matrix which is too large to handle. Um, and so the Newton, uh, the least squares method, by constructing the more Penrodo inverse explicitly, um, is not always available. Uh, at, and so that's why I had to introduce the other methods, but I'm still testing those other methods like GMRES and, and, and other uh, linear solvers that use iterative methods in order to uh, account for this fact. So in order to generalize this to larger discretizations and other equations, I need some better numerical methods. Uh, but for now, uh, the most common routine that I use is I apply this adjoint descent to bring the residual within some, you know, some tolerance of zero. And then if the discretization allows for it, I will apply the Newton, uh, the least squares Newton method um, in order to uh, drive the uh, state towards a doubly periodic orbit. So if this fails, if at any point uh, the step size 
goes beneath some minimum length or the residual does not decrease enough, then the optimization is terminated. Uh, and if the residual is not sufficiently small, then we say that that is a failure. One of the great things about the spatiotemporal method that's afforded to it, that's not afforded to a initial value problem description, is the ability to simply create initial conditions by initializing uh, the spatiotemporal Fourier modes on some tile. So taking some random uh, arbitrarily sized tile, uh, and then taking the Fourier modes on that tile and randomly initializing them and creating some spectrum, uh, you can just create some doubly periodic field, which you can use as uh, an initial condition. Now, this is opposed to using recurrence functions uh, <clears throat> in conventional methods where you integrate in time and then you try to see, uh, you try to find uh, loops or, or proximal close recurrences, which would approximate a periodic orbit hopefully. Um, so this doesn't require time integration. This doesn't require computing pairwise differences of points in state space. All it requires is that you define your dimensions, you define your tile, and then you define your Fourier mode. So uh, the strategies that you can use to modulate the spectrum, of course, you would want to try to approximate the spectrum of a typical kermode shevashinsky equation solution, which is, you know, something that's uh, uh, easier said than done, but at the same time, uh, it turns out that the variational method and, and using the spatiotemporal formulation is quite robust, and so we can take, uh, you know, pretty poor, or they look, you know, nothing like uh, kermode shevashinsky equation solutions, uh, and then we can apply the, new, the optimization algorithms and still find doubly periodic orbits. So, again, reminder that um, in this case, the space-time tiles are allowed to change shape by their temporal and spatial periods are allowed to vary as their independent variables. Um, when starting from uh, random initial conditions, uh, the tile can be, uh, the partial derivatives with respect to changes in period and space can be large. And so you can get these rapid stretchings of space and time that give you nonsense. Uh, and so uh, typically when starting from random initial conditions, I recommend that you damp those in some way, which I leave that uh, detailed uh, to my thesis uh, in the appendix section. But uh, generally speaking, um, you can use random initial conditions to find doubly periodic orbits without putting any constraints on the domain sizes. Um, and if you, you know, if you input this modulation on some uh, large space-time domain, you impose some frequencies and wavelengths on the space-time domain. Uh, typically, you want to aim for what's known as the most unstable wavelength, which is uh, it was the maximum of that spectrum I mentioned in the very beginning uh, that I forgot to mention, actually. Uh, but you want to impose that spatial wavelength or something similar to it, uh, and then impose some type of spatial or temporal scale, which I haven't actually determined yet, but I have some inkling as to what that is, which is based on the space-time patterns I I'm about to show you. Um, but just by imposing these, this modulation of the modes and applying edge joint descent, you can, you know, at least locally, you derive structures that seem to shadow uh, that one pattern that I uh, uh, demonstrated earlier. So uh, even though you don't get something that looks like uh, arbitrary, you know, sections of turbulence, uh, you get some things embedded in the structure starting from random noise on a domain size that is quite large. So um, typical periodic orbits that are used for the Kermano-Shevashinsky equation in previous studies with uh, Predrick students uh, would be defined on a domain of L equals 22, which would be uh, 2.5 times 2, point, 2 pi square root 2, or two and a half of these most unstable wavelength uh, multiples. Uh, so this is a domain which is at 37 uh, approximately, and so already we're like far in the reg regime past the, the, the previous uh, uh, periodic orbit sizes. Another benefit of the spatiotemporal method, so I mentioned that we want to use these patterns and that they shadow invariant tori. Uh, and so by virtue of having these space-time domains and saying that subdomains, and saying subdomains within that domain uh, are shadowing invariant tori, well, that means that we should be able to find find these invariant tori embedded in large space-time simulations. So uh, given a space-time uh, large trajectory, so for instance, uh, we have some large trajectory on the left uh, defined on some very large region of space-time. And then clipping, the reason why it's called clipping is, I, I think for a very intuitive reason, is 
we literally just extract the region of space time and the corresponding field values and then say, OK, well, if we made a smart choice here and this is shadowing a uh, doubly periodic orbit, then we should be able to use it as an optimization initial condition and converge it towards a doubly periodic orbit, which in fact it does in this case. Um, so, you know, I didn't necessarily put in this wasn't like a cherry picked case but of course you would want to choose a clipping in this case that's what i'll refer to these as a clipping which appears to be somewhat periodic right because the worst of an initial condition you give the numerical methods i mean would whichever numerical method you pass it to is more likely to fail uh so in this case, we start with a clipping defined on some spatial temporal domain, and we run it the optimization, and then we find an invariant uh, two torus that uh, uh, approximates it. Now, the tile size changes, so one of the big questions, open questions in this research is, does the torus on the right actually reflect the pattern that we started with? And that's something that uh, I will, I'm looking to describe in the future, but haven't yet. Okay, so that was a demonstration that you can take some regions of space-time and large trajectories and find doubly periodic orbits by simply extracting them. But the main point of this is to find the fundamental orbits. So those are going to be the the, the building blocks of turbulence I, that I previously mentioned. Um, and to do so, uh, the fundamental orbits are going to represent minimal spatiotemporal tori, so they're going to be the smallest periodic orbits that we can find. Uh, now, this idea is motivated by periodic orbit theory and cycle expansion, which show or, or uh, uh, claim that the shortest periodic orbits uh, are indeed the most important, um, and long, larger and longer uh, periodic orbits uh, act as corrections uh, onto curvature corrections to those. So, in in the analogy here is short periodic orbits are small space-time area periodic orbits. Uh, so those are going to be the, the smallest tori we can find. Uh, and then we can use those as building blocks. That's that's the claim. OK, so we start with a periodic orbit uh, given in uh, figure sub-figure A. Uh, and then we can apply this clipping technique I just demonstrated iteratively. So we take the domain from approximately 0 to 40 in time and say, OK, this this structure approximately repeats twice, so we're, we'll claim that it also shadows an invariant torus, which it does. It converges towards uh, a doubly periodic orbit. And then we say, well, uh, subfigure B is just two repeats of the same pattern, so we say that that is just two repeats of the same shadowing. And again, we can find a doubly periodic orbit. And then we just continue this until we find the smallest shape that converges to uh, uh, what we claim is a doubly periodic orbit, which in this case is this wiggly streak, which is coincidentally the name we'll give it. Motivated by symbolic dynamics, um, if you see in figure C, if I claim that D is a fundamental orbit, then the region of space time that's remaining, which is that one streak on the right hand side from two to approximately three, uh, well, that has to be. Uh, another fundamental orbit, because essentially we want to describe uh, infinite space-time as only a collection of shadowings of fundamental orbits. So, you know, if there's only one pattern uh, uh, in a space-time region, then, well, there has to be some kind of uh, orbit that it's shadowing. And in fact, it is shadowing uh, the one wavelength equilibrium solution, which is found by clipping this out and then treating it as an equilibrium. So of course, it's not an equilibrium when it's in the larger space-time, but then uh, you can converge it to the uh, and, and find an equilibrium. Now, continuing this, uh, you know, we take patterns which Beforehand, we don't think are, uh, are, sorry, beforehand we think are unique, and then we end up finding these tori and, and patterns which end up looking like repeats of one another or spatial or symmetry operations, symmetry related uh, patterns. Um, and so by continuing this process, uh, by you know noting that, okay, these are just repeats in time of the same pattern, and in fact you can show that, um, we find three patterns which we for now think are the most important are fundamental orbits. So we've gone from an infinite space time and of arbitrarily complex uh, patterns and shapes to three shapes, um, which I'm going to claim are the building blocks of turbulence. All three of these have interesting properties where they all look somewhat anti-symmetric. Uh, a and C are actually inside uh, the anti-symmetric invariant subspace I mentioned earlier. B is a relative periodic solution, but when it's uh, presented here in 
non-co-moving frame in the physical frame, it also looks anti-symmetric and is somewhat close to being anti-symmetric if you actually did take the uh, uh, reflection and subtracted it. Now, these are claiming by being fundamental represent uh, important physical processes of the Kromodoshevichinsky equation. So a time equilibrium is constant motion, uh, and then uh, the wiggle or figure C is going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the first type of time varying motion. But the most important one is the middle or the defect, which consists of a two to one wavelength merger, and then in the space that is uh, opened up by the, the merger, another wavelength appears such that the resulting uh, pattern is a quarter cell uh, wavelength shift in time. So this is important because it accounts for two processes uh, physically. It, it accommodates um, fluctuations in the global wavelength number and also spatial drifts to the left and the right because if you have a relative periodic orbit and it's drifting to the right, well, its reflection is also a solution, so you also have domains or regions of space time which drift to the left. Um, so let me go back here, uh, just for an instance of a trajectory, we can see that there are, um, there are going to be regions which, you know, look more red on average, which is going to be drifting to the right in this case, and some regions that look more blue on average. So we need some type of description of this local spatial drift velocity, which uh, I'm going to claim is, uh, uh, it manifests as shadowing of this defect, uh, spatial temporal defect. So by virtue of finding these patterns that look similar, you can actually show by numerical continuation that they exist in continuous families, or at least that is the claim. So uh, two of the patterns previously shown, if, they, if you bring them to the same spatial domain size by just imposing, you perturb the, the dimension of the space-time tile, you pin it down, and then you find the orbit that corresponds to that domain size, uh, and you use that to bring two of the patterns together, you can actually show that they arrive at the same thing. So that was uh, one of the uh, reasons why I, I you know, took all those different patterns and said that they were repeats. Uh, one of the reasons are, are pieces of evidence that uh, supports that is um, the fact that uh, you can find them uh, by numerical continu continuation. So it's just, in this case, the fancy pseudo arc like continuation is just literally imposing a constraint. Uh, if you impose that constraint to what I call the spatial temporal streak, which is this one wavelength equilibrium, then you can derive the n cell steady solutions. Uh, it, as far as I know, you can extend it to any arbitrarily sized spatial domain, what I call the wiggle. Uh, when you continue it to a larger spatial domain, which is on the right, you get something that as it gets larger in space, you have this little gap that opens up between where a new wavelength wants to emerge. Uh, and then when you continue it to the left, you find you land on the two uh, cell wavelength solution. So the problem with this type of continuation is you don't know if you actually are tracking the continuous family or not because I haven't done any bifurcation analysis. Um, so I could just be finding a different family of solutions, uh, but for now, uh, I'm, I'm claiming that at least on some finite interval, I have a, a family of solutions. So again, you can do this with the defect. Uh, as you decrease the spatial domain, it tends to get stretched out in time. And as you increase the spatial domain, it tends to get slanted and fall over until it is finally a relative equilibrium, which is likely a bifurcation and not a member of the continuous family. So I'm claiming that these orbits are fundamental, right? But in terms of like the actual spatial temporal patterns, um, they're all made of streaks. So they're all made of just wavelengths and combined with symmetries. So if you take the streaks and then on the left-hand side, if you take the streaks and then impose some slant towards them and then you make them come back and converge towards each other, you can find um, the, the spatial temporal wiggle, as I call it. So that's this is literally taking the one wavelength equilibrium solution, manipulating it in some way, and then finding the other fundamental orbits. Likewise, you can do the same with the defect. You put two wavelengths next to each other, and then you put one wavelength on top of it, and then you can find the defect. So by virtue, like this, this confuses me at least by saying, okay, everything's comprised of streaks, but then when you impose different symmetries and different sized domains, then you get these more complex structures. So there's definitely something I'm missing uh, still. But I think the analogy here is to say, well, all storms and all weather patterns are made of clouds, but that doesn't just mean if you have one cloud, you can build everything from it. Like it's, it's not that simple. So uh, even though everything's made from streaks, um, I don't think it's as simple as just everything is one streak. Uh, now, 
in terms of missing fundamental orbits, so this would be akin to missing uh, missing symbols in a symbolic alphabet. Uh, I don't know if what we're missing. I, this is another you know open problem in this regard, where it's hard to tell if you're able to construct all admissible orbits because you don't know if you have the entire alphabet. But I do know that there are certain patterns that are missing. Uh, for instance, on the left hand side, we have a higher order defect here, which takes more than two wavelengths and then merges them into one. And then on the right. I have what I tentatively call a streak patch, which is just a large region of space time which shadows uh, an end cell steady solution. Now the fun stuff. With these clippings and with these fundamental orbits, I said that you can uh, shadow regions of space time and that all regions of space time can be uh, described as a collection of these shadowings, which means that you should be able to glue together these building blocks, glue together these periodic orbits to form larger and larger periodic orbits. And in fact, you can do this. So for instance, in this case, I take two relative periodic orbits and I stack them in time and I find the, the corresponding converged periodic orbit, um, relative periodic orbit. Likewise, you can do this in space. So in this case, I do it with a shift reflection, two shift reflection invariant orbits, uh, and then I glue them together in a manner before of this schematic where I take uh, uh, one of the orbits and I stick either half on the left and right hand side spatially because I want the result to also have shift reflection symmetry and this is the way of preserving that. Um, so you can take these orbits in spatial uh, and cut, cut them up in space and then glue them together. Likewise, if you take the result of this spatial gluing and you glow it with yet another shift reflection invariant orbit with, whose tile size is vastly different. So notice that their temporal periods are, are vastly different. One has temporal period of approximately 25 and the other one's at 65, you can still glue them together. Uh, using that bad approximation, you can find another periodic orbit which exists with shift reflection symmetry. Um, and it makes sense that the tile size is approximately, the temporal period is approximately the average of the two original ones. So somehow it's able to find uh, periodic orbits. Now, the main point of this was the previous uh, uh, gluings I showed you in time and in space, uh, those were test cases for the uh, more general building block case of spatiotemporal gluing. So this was the whole basis of the uh, uh, theory, the whole basis or motivation of the project was we use the building blocks and we, we, we make configurations of them in space and time, and then we're able to derive some region of space and time, which is uh, an accurate solution to the kermode shibashinsky equation. So in this case, if I take my three uh, symbols or my three orbits that I claimed were fundamental before, so namely the defect, the wiggle, and the streak, and I put them in some spatiotemporal configuration, which is just randomly generated, uh, then I can, I can uh, try to find periodic orbits. So I first start with uh, smaller ones uh, and in this experimentation, which is still ongoing, I'm using different members of the continuous families because there's a lot of different numerical details which you can try to exploit, such as applying symmetries to the tiles, such as numerically continuing them to different sizes, such as uh, uh, taking different members of the group orbits um, to try to find uh, things that converge numerically. But in this case, I give you two examples. So one is a two by two symbolic representation and the other is a two by four, uh, where the rows are with respect to time and the, the columns are with respect to space. And then I converge those towards uh, periodic orbits. Now the first one, the two by two, it looks more represent representative of the original configuration I started with. The second one, not so much. So this points out the main problem with this type of uh, gluing is that even though it's converging numerically, you have no idea or no way of categorizing without visual inspection whether or not it's actually arriving at the symbolic representation you started with, right? So I can configure these symbols and I can find a periodic orbit, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that symbol configuration is uh, admissible. So it could be converging to a different numerical orbit just by virtue of the robustness of the uh, uh, numerical methods. So again, I go back to the uh, the larger tiling I started with and in this case, it was a five by five uh, shape. Uh, and then I run it through the optimization and I get something that while I wouldn't say that it's a converged orbit, I would say that it is approaching something uh, that at least is shadowing a converged orbit. Uh, so on the left, you have the, the defect, the wiggle and different uh, streaks uh, being glued together. And on the right, you have the corresponding uh, space-time tile, which I'm saying is shadowing an orbit. The culmination of all of this is, okay, well, we want to try to apply this to large space-time. Um, so let's just try it, right? So in this case, I take a 30-minute tiling um, made of defects, 
streaks. Uh, and in this case, I actually used uh, relative equilibria instead of equilibria because, again, I'm still numerically experimenting with all these things, and I want to try and uh, replicate the local spatial shifts that exist in arbitrary uh, uh, simulations. And with this uh, 30 by 30, I get something um, that I would say doesn't approximate a arbitrary trajectory because it looks too uniform, but it does look much more like an orbit would than what I started with. So, um, you know, depending, like, honestly, if I, if you showed this to me and you didn't tell me it wasn't an orbit, I don't think I would be able to tell at least visually because the, if I look anywhere, uh, the shapes seem to be uh, uh, at least each locally shadowing uh, doubly periodic orbits of um, the kerman oshiba equation. Now, just to give you, uh, you know, a frame of reference here, um, the spatial domain is 54 unstable wavelengths long, uh, and the periodic orbits we're used to working with are, exist on 2.5. Regardless as to whether this is exactly shadowing a huge invariant torus or not, uh, I think that the methods have some, um, you know, some, have some virtue to them just by virtue of uh, being able to show that there exists something that approaches something doubly periodic on a huge domain like this. Um, now, of course, there's still a lot of work in the future. In summary, what, what I've shown, or at least hopefully shown to you and proved to you, is that by using a variational formulation that's defined in space-time, uh, you can define robust numerical methods which allow a lot of different, uh, or afford you a lot of new capabilities, such as creating random initial conditions, uh, so you don't have to use recurrence functions anymore, which, of course, don't scale properly or, or, or very well because of integration. Uh, but you can also use these new techniques that I've dubbed uh, clipping and gluing, which I want to emphasize, um, even though it looks like I've been copying and pasting pictures together, I, I want to reemphasize that, that these are uh, uh, doubly periodic solutions to a chaotic nonlinear PDE in, in two dimensions. Um, so, you know, I think it's easy to gloss over that as I just show you pretty picture after pretty picture. But this is, at least in some cases, able to use building blocks or fundamental orbits as building blocks to find larger periodic orbits in space and time. Now, if I rephrase these uh, summary points uh, in terms of some, maybe some more attractive or more interesting uh, uh, terminology, allowing the spatial domain size to vary as a function of uh, the optimization problem process, well, that's like allowing the Reynolds number to vary and, or the spatial dimension in fluid flow. So imagine you're in uh, pipe flow or plain coet flow, and you're essentially allowing the governing equations to determine the correct uh, local Reynolds, Reynolds number or spatial domain size. So instead of having to, you know, go through or work through some specific motivation or, or uh, uh, you know, sp specific argument or reasoning for why you chose the Reynolds number you did in your computations, well, now you can just, if this generalizes to Navier-Stokes, you could, in theory, just allow the equations to figure out the correct Reynolds number for that particular shape. Uh, likewise, uh, continuation of the solutions uh, in the spatial domain, uh, if you have an experimental setup that you're trying to match with, for instance, uh, uh, these simulations, and let's say something breaks and you have to rebuild the experimental setup, well, if you're all of your experiment or all of your computational results could go out the window if you know they no longer match the setup of the experiment. But if you were able to continue them in space, then you would, you could account for uh, uh, changes to your experimental setup. Likewise, the clipping and gluing—it's a very intuitive idea, at least. Uh, and so I hope that generalizes to larger space times. Uh, I'm saying that the uh, fundamental patterns in, of space-time that we know or, or people have been trying to use to explain uh, turbulence in, in fluid flow, for instance, streaks, self-sustaining processes, hairpin vortices, all, you know, vortex shedding, uh, uh, stretching, sorry, uh, all of these shapes and patterns that are well known, I think that even though there's been an inability to, to you know, use them as zoom blocks, it may just be because they've been incorrectly used. So if they were used with the variational formulation in space-time, they might actually serve as building blocks. Of course, there's computational advantages and disadvantages. So the main disadvantages, as I'm running out of time or already have ran out of time, uh, the main computational disadvantage is um, uh, the computational memory requirement. So it, it, the ability to, you know, in, in hold all of these disc uh, uh, computational degrees of freedom in memory, uh, and then of course that whether or not that scales is to be. Uh, uh, determined, but um, there have been some papers by some aerodynamicists uh, that essentially say space-time is the way to go because uh, you can 
parallelize the computations by solving locally on different regions of space-time and then uh, 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 scaling that to uh, each occur on a single core, for instance. Um, now, in terms of my computations, using a global basis, global basis functions as Fourier uh, expansion, you can't subdivide the domain like that unless you, you know, get much more complex into methods that are literally called spectral decomposition methods. Uh, but so what I would say is my the downside of my techniques is that they don't really generalize well to complex geometries or um, um, uh, uh, larger and like really large regions of space time. Um, but we no longer have dynamics. We no longer you know have to have only finite prediction windows. Uh, you can find relatively large periodic orbits exactly. So the the which have large periods uh, in time uh, and space. Um, but again, I don't know if these things generalize. So moving forward, uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions in regards to the gluing process. For instance, if your tiles, if your fundamental orbits exist in continuous families, that's akin to saying you have a you have a symbolic dynamics where your letters, your alphabet, is rubbery. So you have some dependence of admissibility on the different family members you're using just by virtue of the alphabet being dependent or being existing on different ranges of temporal and spatial periods. Uh, likewise, being able to exploit that, being able to exploit all the different symmetries that exist, uh, and then being able to formulate symbolic dynamics from that is not an easy undertaking. But what I've tried to do here is just show that it's at least possible to use building blocks in the kerman oshibashinsky equation. So it's at least feasible that some type of symbolic dynamics might exist. Uh, I would say that the symbolic dynamics is obviously the main focus. And then determining admissibility uh, is really hard unless you do visual in inspection. And so I'm looking towards um, uh, tools like persistent homology and convolutional ne neural networks, which uh, actually have already been implemented into the coding package I'm releasing. Uh, it has the uh, possibility to do use convolutional neural networks to try and uh, reproduce symbolic representations, as well as use uh, persistent homology to detect uh, uh, topological signatures of these different fundamental orbits. But I haven't done enough investigations uh, regarding that to report on it here. But it is built into the to the package. That's all. <laughs> Uh, so if there are any questions, uh, I would appreciate it. I have a, a question this, uh, on this idea of this, uh, the fundamental orbits and um, mm -hmm. the, what, how many there are. It seems like to me um, that <laughs> depending upon on your system size, the size of your fundamental, you know, the fundamental orbits of your family is going to depend. I think you, you said that. And you mentioned something about somehow, I mean, you even said yourself, there's a kind of a sort of notion of there may be bifurcations as a function of continuation as space or time mm -hmm. parameters you change that you get bifurcations perhaps you didn't explore this to different fundamental orbits so you come down to the point where now you have let what you call fundamental orbits and but they're still on small space time blocks but now what, right. what the issue is, is that if you're making those if you're making that still bigger there may be bifurcations or something that lead to other members of the family which which, which you're sort so, of getting at maybe by poor man's way of, of gluing. And I guess uh, what I'm worried about oh, is I you think still, still have the problem that it's extensive, that there will be, as yeah. you get larger and larger, there will be more and more of these. And, th and then you're still back to the problem of figuring out what are those, what's the members of the fundamental family as you get the system size gets larger. Why do you think yeah. three is it? It's three continuous families plus their group orbits of the five or the endings of the uh, continuous families, those are only happening as an extension of you increase the space-time tile to a size where more than one pattern can exist, but I don't think that's necessarily a different pattern. I think it's merely a statement of saying, okay, now instead of having the one defect, when you increase the spatial size by a certain amount, then you have to have a defect plus another streak. So the extensive nature of it's coming from com combinations or configurations of the fundamental tiles, uh, higher order defects where you have more than one wavelength merging into each other that would yeah. require a different fundamental orbit. And there might be, you know, a quote unquote family of defects where, you know, you have two, three, four wavelengths merging into one. When I say they're ending in bifurcation, I view that as they're terminating or that solution is is unable to uh, be described by a single fundamental orbit anymore. Therefore, 
they're reaching a size where they need more than one fundamental orbit. Because the fundamental orbits exist on a rubbery tile, uh, the shapes are, are flexible. So you can, you know, if you, let's say you had one fundamental orbit that was seven units in space and another one that was eight units in space. Well, those two uh, uh, manifestations could build something that's 15 units in space. But when you ask, okay, well, what about 15.1 units in space? Well, then you kind of have to stretch your original tiles a little bit and see if it makes 15.1. I'm less worried about scale. I'm more worried about topology actually you gave the example of like here's the thing with the, with the, with the one defect state but then you said oh here's this thing with sort of two you know defects from two rolls or something which you which you you can't get from the one right so that's a new thing and then you know that you know more of those sort of topologically different you you you, you have to come to grips with that or i mean it seems like that becomes more and more does it converge this is what i'm trying to get some understanding qualitatively when you start to think about it in terms of Torah and topology, it's not as intuitive as like I'm gluing patterns together. You know, uh, uh, you know, this pattern plus this pattern equals a pattern that looks similar. When you th start to think about it as topology, it's really you're chopping things up and you're trying to stretch these Torah to make another torus. But sometimes if you stretch a torus too hard, then it breaks apart. I think that you should be able to detect the topological signatures of fun fundamental orbits, much like you say, and so then you can detect how many defects there are in something, how many streaks there are in something. I think the, the general takeaway is that um, the extensive nature of the number of shapes can now be described as uh, com combinations and permutations of a finite number of symbols, uh, as opposed to just arbitrarily randomly shaped things. I'm going to ask one more right now, which is actually sort of from reading your thesis and describing your, your the gluing technique. So when you actually to take out like the 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 let's say the smaller mm -hmm. the smaller tile what you tended to do to as you mentioned it's it, what you're trying to match to is in some sense there's some it's not it's not doubly periodic on that smaller scale so you had right. to do something at the edges and your right. technique was to basically pad with zeros and i guess i wondered um because you know there's a whole the whole world of windowing that shows up in uh, Fourier analysis and i guess you know with right. all these yeah. All the, well, does it just not matter? You just you just did that because that's the simplest thing, or is it? Can you actually do better if you do like all these fancy windowing? I functions? I started off with zero padding. Well, no, actually, I started off with doing a convex combination of the boundaries, and then I started off, and then I thought of oh well, I can just impose like Chebe, like Chebyshev polynomials on that, and then find you know solve a different uh, boundary value problem, but. I realized that I was making the gluing process more complex than the entire optimization process. Started with zero padding was just because it was the simplest thing. No, it's not uh, fundamental. Uh, like, I would just say, right. I, I was just a suggestion because there's a whole there's a whole history of doing yes. windowing and their differences mm -hmm. and such. It's not going to be fundamental, but it's. I would just suggest maybe that we it might be helpful right. to look at because right. that's what people do when you don't have strictly non-periodic right. data as you do this right. kind of windowing approach. Personally, I think the notion of their building being building blocks of turbulence is kind of amazing, personally. Like just yeah. thinking that there are small shapes that actually could be yeah, used as like Legos together uh, is kind of crazy to me. Ideas, the big ideas, including the building blocks thing, right? I agree, that's really intriguing and you know, it's an understatement to say it's not obvious, because if it works, fantastic. A, a real theory should be falsifiable. Mm -hmm. if the, the question becomes, is there, what's, is there a task that you would set up as the thing which would, in principle, falsify this idea if you tried it and it failed? If I take some combination or configuration of orbits, because I don't know the best way of combining them yet, or you know the way of exploiting continuous families or or symmetries, if it fails to converge numerically, is that a you know if I can't reproduce something, then am I just missing a fundamental orbit? Can it just is it inadmissible? Like that's that's the thing. Like I need some known shapes to be able to try to reproduce. I'm not confident that I have all of the pieces yet because there's still a lot of details that are missing. I definitely think it has not stood up to the theoretical tests that I would be happy with.